I invite you to find a comfortable position, perhaps close your eyes, your feet flat on the floor. And just breathe in and out. Let go of all that came before and any plans for tomorrow. Just be here now with each breath. Perhaps chanting to yourself, God is the love that I am. God is the love that I am. Find that peace, divine inner place, and be present with your breath.
if you're ready, bring your awareness back into the room. Welcome everybody to our beloved sanctuary, both here in the room and at home with that wonderful modern technology, Zoom and Facebook Live. A loving reminder, please, if you haven't already, turn off your phone or perhaps silence it. And might I suggest you do it at home? And that way we can spend the next hour in divine communication or communing with the divine. We're so glad for those of you that have joined us while the meditation was in progress that you've joined us virtually in person. Let's begin with our opening chant. God is in this place. God is in this place. God is in this place. God is in this So at this moment, in this divine place, I know that the presence of spirit is present within each and every one of us, that God is the divine inspiration, the intelligence and the wisdom of our entire universe, that God is all that is good, everywhere present at all times. This power permeates each and every thing, place, person, and thing on this planet and everywhere there is consciousness. And I know that each of us are aligned perfectly with that divine knowingness, that place of inspiration, that unique connection to the divine within. We are all imbued with the treasures, abilities, and love that God has for anybody, anywhere, anytime. It is ours to have and hold just in this place, in this moment, at any time of our choosing. So I claim and affirm that this service is already blessed, that the lovely Reverend Sydney will deliver the word conveyed to her as the word of God. She will also double as our musical host tonight, <laughs> running back and forth, I'm sure, displaying that adroit perfection that she already is. But I also know that Coming here together, we lift one another up through the word. We join together metaphorically, hand to hand, and know the peace, truth, and divine inspiration that is within us all. And we carry that from here tonight to wherever and however we go, to those we meet, and to our home. And I know we're all equally blessed by the musings and stylings of our soulless Mary Highland, by the technological crew that supports this service. We are all blessed by one another and we come together in peace and love and harmony and the joy that is inherent in God's love and life. So I'm grateful to know that this is the truth for us all. I celebrate it, my heart soars like a hawk. And I say, thank you God for this moment, for this divine inspiration. I release this word into the law of mind, knowing it is so, and together we can say, amen. Let's say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. It's this day, our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive each and Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Amen. You say you see no hope. You say you see no reason to dream 
that the world would ever change You're saying love is foolish to believe That there'll always be some crazy With an army or a knife To wake you from your daydream Put the fear back in your life Look, if someone wrote a play just to glorify what's stronger than hate Would they not arrange the stage To look as if the hero came too late Is almost in defeat It's looking like the evil side will win But on the edge of every scene From the moment that the whole thing begins It is love who makes the mortar Love who stacked these stones Love who made the stage here Although it looks like we're alone In this scene set in shadows Like the night is here to stay Looks like evil cast around us But it's love who wrote the play in the darkness, love will show the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now the stage is set. You feel your own heart beating in your chest. This life's not over yet. So we get up on our feet and do our best. We play against the fears, play against the reasons not to try, playing for the feet, tears, burning in the happy angel's eyes. It is love who makes the mortar, love who stacked these stones, love who made the stage here although it looks like we're alone in this scene set in shadows like the night is here to stay looks like evil cast around us but it's love who wrote the play is in the darkness love will show Thank you. If I'm adroit at all, and boy, that's a great word. I don't think anyone's ever described me that way. It's because of my comfortable shoes. So it's all about the shoes. Ministry is all about the shoes. Okay. Wow. Um, it's been quite a week here in Lake Wobegon. How's everybody doing? There's a lot of stuff going on, right? Who knew? Well, I think we all did. I, I'm, I'm at a loss. I mean, I have a talk, but I, I am at a loss for being able to, to find context, to find um, meaning. But what I can do is bring some of the musings and some of the thoughts that I'm having today about what is happening in our world. And I just want to offer them to you. And if they help, great. And if they don't, then just leave them and help me. Help me. Um, 
One of the books that I like to use is a book called Hope and Other Superpowers, a life-affirming, love-defending, butt-kicking, world-saving manifesto by John Pavlovitz. Could be Pavlovitz, I'm not sure. But if you have not ever read any of his material, I just want to suggest buy anything or everything you find. Um, he doesn't mess around. He's formerly a Presbyterian minister, I believe, and he, um, he calls it the way he sees it, which is, are we responding in love? Are we being the love, or are we, uh, are we, are we hypocrites or not? Or, and he will point out, this is hypocrisy, that's not. This is oneness, that's not. And what I'm getting is that all of this stuff that we see going on in the world, and man, you will hear me talking about this all month, probably for the rest of my life, everything that we are seeing right now is an effect it's separation. It's a demonstration of the separation that you and I collectively, personally, individually, collectively, have within us about our divine identity. If we do not know that we are one of, one with, and one as God, then we think that it's God and something else. God and, God and, God and. And the thing is, this is showing up in such strong measure right now in this world because there's separation between us. So how is it demonstrating? In violence. Boy, does that get my attention. It's showing up as violence. Boy, does that get my attention. And I really do understand that we, we have a role to play here. We absolutely have a role to play here. We have to heal that separation within ourselves, we need to really, really work and practice that divinity, that oneness. And it, if you have to fake it, would you please fake it? Would you please? Because I have a kid who's 23, and I'd like to see him make it to a ripe old age. I'd like him to give me grandkids. And I know that a lot of you feel the same way, not about him, but your own families. But we need to begin living as if we know we have a spiritual identity, a spiritual value, a spiritual destiny. We have to do that. Because as we do that, we begin to cultivate the awareness of that. We live in what we call in religious science the mental equivalent. We embody it. We must live into that. One, so I'm a spiritual activist, and um, I have irritated quite a few people with my activism, so I'm not even going to tell you where my Facebook page is on that. But it is that Jesus sat down with hookers and homeless and whores and criminals, and he was a barefoot, long-haired hippie who, who begged and didn't have a roof over his head, nor did he have a permanent career. He was a spiritual activist. He preached love. So that's the path I follow. I will call things out that I see as being unloving, as not reflective of what I know we are here to be and to do. So that is, that is my story. And John Pavlovitz says that being the kind of person the world needs right now means having, ah, a creative vision a creative vision, seeing what the world could be in a way that others may not be able to. We have to imagine a world we've never known while acknowledging the one that has existed. This is essential so that we don't simply replicate toxic, toxic systems of our past. This takes some radical imagination and a willingness to lean into the unknown. And I'm saying that we have to not just lean into the unknown, we need to live into the vision. We must live into a vision of the world we want. The world we want to live in. The world we want our children to live in, our grandchildren. The world we want to breathe in. The world we want to share in. The world we want to connect in. We must lean into and live into that vision. The time for talking about it was over years and years ago. And this is why we must begin to embody that world and the qualities of that world. And what are those qualities? 
Well, the first thing I'm going to say is compassion. Compassion, understanding, patience, love, forgiveness. And the thing that I really like about what John Pavlovitz has to say is that many of us in times of great stress in the world, we step away from that which we know feeds us and nourishes us and allows us to live into our own vision of possible life. And in, this, in these times, we can't do that. We have to remember what feeds us, what nourishes us. And I'm going to read a, a passage to you from this book, and, and I'll hope that you'll just be patient with me as I do this. Um, he talks about a friend, and he says, My friend Dana recently shared on social media that he'd been suffering headaches for a few weeks, that he'd been irritable and had difficulty concentrating. Such things are regular occurrences for me these days, and almost internal white noise, but for him it was unusual and cause for concern. After talking to his wife and taking an inventory of his daily practices and routine, he noted that he hadn't been drinking any water at all. He'd consumed coffee and soda almost exclusively. Wondering if this might be the source of his recent ailments, he began steadily drinking copious amounts of water, and a day or so he began to feel a hundred times better, and his symptoms gradually subsided. Dana hadn't realized that he'd been chronically dehydrated, which is actually quite common. He says, in the past, I've worked as a personal trainer, and one of the things I would always tell clients is you have to drink water when you're not thirsty. By the time you actually feel thirsty, thirsty, it's too late. You're already dehydrated, and you can't catch up immediately on hours or even weeks of neglect. You really need to consume the water required for your workout well before your workout. Continual hydration is the, sac is the secret to maintaining physical health. So then he goes on. He says, recently, I have noticed an internal heaviness, an irritability and sadness that worry me. Like my friend Dana, I did an inventory of the daily rhythms of my life, and I realized I am spiritually dehydrated. I am emotionally parched, chronically joy-deprived. For months, I've been walking around without regularly allowing my soul to be replenished, largely avoiding life-giving activities, waiting for circumstances to feel favorable enough to let lightness return. Anybody else doing that? And he says, often when our lives or the world looks bleak, we retreat in our despair and we lose the desire to create and to play. We abandon the daily pursuits that give life meaning. We stop painting, writing, and cooking, exercising, eating well, and meditating. We divert that otherwise life-giving, hope-inducing, stress-alleviating energy into simply managing our grief. This is why the world needs people who create right now more than ever because that glowing light in the center of our chests and the spectacular art it produces is life-giving, not just to us, but to the world. When what we make becomes a conduit of joy, traveling to others and then returning to us multiplied exponentially. We have all gone through loss and grief and trauma and we have a choice. Are we going to live there? Are we going to identify as that? Or are we going to come back to the remembrance, the divine remembering of who we are, which is that we are spiritual beings. We're spiritual beings. And you've heard me say before, and I will continue to say it, that we are spiritual beings living in a spiritual world governed by spiritual laws, yet we forget. And the spiritual journey is one of forgetting, then remembering, forgetting, then remembering, where all of us now need to remember. And we need to remember big time. We need to remember, and we need to do whatever it is we can do, because vibrationally, energetically, we are how the world lifts. We are how the shift is going to happen. Now, I'm not saying it has to happen here with you individually, except, yeah, it absolutely does have to happen with you individually. But as we do this, the rest of the world does it as well. And I know that there are churches throughout this whole planet. There are synagogues. There are mosques. There are temples. There are, there are people sitting online, and they're saying, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? How can we lift the world? How can we shift this? How can we shift this? And the answer is that we have to shift it. 
by shifting ourselves. We must live into the vision. We must live as the truth that we are because the truth is going to set us free. The truth sets us free. Now, for me, that is one of the most profound things that I ever, ever heard. And I have seen it happen over and over and over again in life. I've seen it happen with friends of mine who were living out of integrity in their relationships and finally told the truth about them. And yes, they absolutely went through that, that period of pain and darkness, but guess what? When they came out on the other side, every single person was set free. Not just the two people in the relationship or the three people in the relationship who were connected with that, but the family, the children, everybody finally had permission to be who they were. Are we brave enough to tell the truth about who we are? Can we do that? Can we begin to do that now? Because if we don't do it, we're living a dehydrated life. And I don't want to live that way. I can't live that way. I know I can't live that way. And certainly not be of service to you, to my family, to the world. I can't be of service to ministry, to my music, to any of that. So my toddle, to, my toddle, ta-da, ta-da, my title tonight, take two. We'll fix that later on in the mix, right? Okay, thank you very much. My title tonight is Fifty Shades of God. Now, first of all, let's make something very clear. God is not limited to any one shade. God is not limited to any one spectrum of color, culture, age, ethnicity, or gender. And as we step into this month today of LGBTQ plus pride awareness, understand that in this church, in this community, in this teaching, everyone, everyone is a creation of spirit. Everyone is a whole creation of spirit. And no matter whom you love, Yes, exactly. What you look like or where you have come from, we honor you, we welcome you, we accept you, and we absolutely cherish you. That's not just lip service. I sound really angry, don't I? Because I'm really, I am so, I'm so fired up by what I see happening in the world, and I'm so clear that our, our sense of, of separation and not thinking that we are enough is what is causing this. I'm so clear about that. We think there isn't enough. We think there isn't enough money, that, th that there isn't enough food, there isn't enough employment, not enough work, not enough love, whatever that is. And that is so bogus. That's so bogus. It's not the truth. The truth is that we are part of God, and God is infinite. God is not limited, certainly not by my opinions, certainly not by that. So we are not here to change you, to fix you, or to do anything other than try to offer ways that you can start to see yourself as God sees you. That's it. We want you to know, we want everyone to know that they are part of the sacred and beautiful tapestry of life. So we bless and honor the LGBTQIA identity and transgender life as high and holy identities with sacred roles to play in the unfoldment of humanity. And let me just add to that, Jesus, who never, ever, ever talked about abortion or sexual identity, did tell his disciples to put down their weapons. So I'm conflicted. I, you know, I thought as I was working on my talk, the world is right now is beyond distressing if I focus on that. Violent events seem to be conspiring to drown the voices of love and hope. And yet I am so very, very certain of our great collective and innate divinity. I am so, so certain of it. And I can't help but turn to that again and again and again because we are part of something which is so much greater than all of that. So much greater than all of it. And my insistence on spiritual vision rather than television is based on the most profound thing I can think of this day, which is that the truth will set you free. So I think that for many of us, we are living in a trance of distraction, deception, and desperation. We're distracted by fear and limited race thinking. We are deceived by fear and race thinking. We're in desperation because of our fear and our race thinking. Yet every time I hear a story about the truth setting someone free, I can't help but loosen my attachment to my fear and my, my participation in that race thinking. So 
I have a couple of stories to tell you about that. One in particular, I may not get to the second one, um, but I have a friend who is a musician. I have known this person for well over 20 years as one of the world's most gifted, skilled, innovative, and courageous jazz musicians in the world. So, I, I want to do this in a, a, a good, healthy way. I spent years as a professional jazz pianist and studio musician here in LA. And although I grew up in religious science and other new thought traditions, what was clear to me was that the music industry was not anchored in a great deal of emancipated or evolutionary thinking, nor is the entertainment industry. It's getting better, right? But as a woman, I often found myself surrounded by prejudice, discrimination, mean behavior, and what, I've, what I have come to describe as copious and obvious displays of immature snark. So, you know, the music business is very competitive and it's a fear-based industry. And walking that path in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, I was constantly trying to find ways to tread lightly, keep moving forward, and try not to get hurt by any flying objects. I, it's governed by fear, right? It's fear and ego. I wanted to make a big musical impact because a girl's got to eat. And at the same time, I was also seeing the ways in which some musicians could be not just negative, but very quick and skilled at piercing the light with their darkness. And we all know these people, right? They, behind every silver lining is a big dark cloud. Well, that's a lot of musicians and that's a lot of people in the entertainment industry. So in the midst of this, I used to work sometimes with a spectacularly talented bass player. He was a phenom. He worked with Carmen McRae, Doc Severinsen, Tony Bennett, the Tonight Show Orchestra, Mel Torme. He was the kind of musician who would make other musicians sound better simply because his talent was so big and so generous. I always looked forward to playing with him because I knew I would just be in this, this place of, of bliss, of creative bliss. Always friendly, thoughtful, and open-hearted. He never fell into the stereotype of dark, negative, homophobic, or misogynistic. And by the way, that's something that not just male musicians, but females do. Sometimes we do that just to fit in, to get along, right? So what most of us who worked with him did not know, and I didn't know until recently, um, well, actually, let me think about 15 years ago now that I think about it. Um, every night he would go home to his wife and then he would transform and change clothes, put on a wig, and go out as a woman. He was living in gender dysphoria, gender incongruence, um, and his wife actually helped create a space for him to be authentic in that. Um, he knew he was supposed to be a woman, but through ever what you want to call it, a miracle of birth or an accident of gestation, he was born with male genitalia. Now for years he played concerts and high profile gigs all over the world, recording amazing albums, and he moved people with his talent and incredible, incredible gifts. But when he would return to the sanctity of his hotel room after playing at the Montreal Jazz Festival, the Hollywood Bowl, stages in Tokyo, New York, Paris, or Kansas City, he would drop the mask. He had beautiful wigs, clothes, gorgeous shoes. His makeup skills rivaled any top fashion model you can think of. Finally, he decided he couldn't do it anymore. And knowing that it probably would mean the end of his music career, he decided he had to live in full congruency and integrity with his true identity. So the very few trusted people who knew about his real life supported him and loved him and encouraged him to be true to that divine longing that was calling to him in an ever louder voice, telling him that the truth would set him free. That's a tough thing to believe. He knew that potentially and very probably there would be hard choices, sacrifices, and loss, but, loss, but living a lie was no longer a sustaining protocol for him. And what we know as people who follow this teaching, whether we are part of the community, part of the family, or we are ministers, or we are spiritual teachers, or practitioners, or just being trying to be awake humans, the truth does always set us free. As, um, as we've heard, though, first it's going to piss us off. So, but my friend was done with not being free. His wife served him with divorce papers. She'd gone as far as she could. 
but now it was time for her to live her own truth. And the very next day, he began hormone therapy in preparation for gender reassignment surgery. Now, my friend's story is actually beautifully, beautifully told in a documentary titled, I Stand Corrected. Um, and he speaks guilelessly and even with some awe about how his transformation from John Lydon bass player to Jennifer Lydon bass player was received by those artists, celebrities, and musicians who had, he had formerly worked with when he was not Jennifer Lydon, female bass player. So Doc Severinsen, who directed the Tonight Show Orchestra, for many years responded with his characteristic growl, I hired a bass player. I didn't hire a man or a woman. I hired a bass player. Ed Shaughnessy, who was the Tonight Show drummer, said, Jennifer's an amazing musician. That's all there is to it. She has been featured on the cover of Vanity Fair. She's living her best life, and her truth has most certainly set others free as well. Jennifer honors the support of those around, there, around her with being there to listen, to try and understand, and to accept her on her very, very sacred and specific journey. She was actually astonished, and she'll talk about this, that although there were instances of stupidity and bullying, the people that mattered the most behaved as allies, and sometimes even as protectors and defenders, because that's who we are. We recognize instinctively that when truth is setting something and someone free, we must not only be there to help midwife that, but we must be allies of that, in that, for all of it. And particularly, can we do that for ourselves? Now, she still encounters challenges when she tours and performs in the South. Bathrooms are restricted. She plays in places where gender, gender norms are still rigidly and religiously held onto. She gets bullied, and it's scary. But her truth, capital T, is so compelling, she keeps going. She's been able to live in a world peopled, sometimes surprisingly, <sighs> with advocates and allies. She has not been terrorized and locked out. She has been set free. Having an advocate is empowering. Having an ally is transformative. It's transformative. So the other story I'm going to tell you about briefly is about a young man I want to call the ageless child. The Monday after Thanksgiving 2016, I helped my son, who at that time was the senior in high school, get out the door for his morning classes and opened up the computer to find an email from his high school. It read, grief counselors and therapists will be on site at Newburgh High School today to help students cope with this weekend suicide of classmate, senior Daniel Texter. Now, I am not a woo person by any means. But my intuition went into really, really high gear, and I quickly jumped over to Facebook and found Daniel Texter's page, except that it was Danny, D-A-N-I, and he so clearly was a sacred youth in transition. Now, Danny's family were Jehovah's Witnesses and were absolutely unaccepting of Danny's gender dysphoria. And at the funeral service for Danny, which was held at a local church, the minister began his words by saying, Many of you knew Daniel by the name he had been, been using recently, Danny. But his family has asked me to refer to him by his given name, Daniel, throughout this service. I will be respecting their wishes. And with that, an individual's life, meaning and personal significance, was systematically and systemically denied. He was dead named. So I never knew him. And my son didn't know him very well. Danny's friends were aware of his pain and suffering, but they never expected him to choose death by suicide. And those same friends, by the way, totally accepted him. And despite the conservative nature of most of this town where we were living, they had no problem accepting Danny. Danny was just Danny, said my son's best friend, Tommy, who, by the way, is gay. And my son is a cisgendered white boy, straight white boy, whose two best friends, one of them is trans and the other one is gay. Because he grew up in, 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 in a culture, and, well, in a family, I'm going to say. But also, his generation is different, right? He's not once described any of his friends by where they are in the gender spectrum. Um, and apparently, that's something I still do here on Planet Sydney. 
But my, my son went, you know, when I, when I said, wow, when did Tommy come out, his friend, his gay friend, he said, well, I don't know, why? And I'd known Tommy since he was five. I, and I don't know, why? Does it matter? No. So Jennifer had allies. She had family and friends who either overtly or covertly just agreed to be present. Danny needed allies. Danny needed just one adult ally. So in a recent study conducted by the Trevor Project, and if you have not heard what the Trevor Project is, it's an organization that stands for keeping trans youth alive. They have a suicide hotline. You all, you all can go train for it, by the way, and begin to be part of this dynamic and amazing let's tell the truth now and lift everybody up and set them free solution. But they, um, they did a study and LGBTQ youth who report having at least one accepting adult were 40%, 40% less likely to attempt suicide. And they also report that more than 1.8 million LGBTQ young people between the ages of 13 and 24 contemplate suicide. They contemplate a suicide attempt each year. So here's the kicker. There's a thing called minority stress. Minority stress created by stigma, discrimination, bullying, or a perception of bias is created as the main detractor to the mental health of LGBTQ youth. And I'm gonna say it's gonna be the main detractor for anyone, anyone who is in an experience of not being fully loved, allied, supported, and blessed, and held in a place of deep knowing. Now I know that this material is not light and fluffy and fun and let's all go out dancing and bowling and have a beer together kind of stuff, but oh my gosh, we have to know that the truth is not just going to set someone like Danny free and my friend Jennifer, but all of us free as well. Whether it's about being gay or straight or black or white or young or old or tall or short or, or able-bodied or not able-bodied, this is what it is. We have to begin to really, really, really tell that truth. So I am, as I said, a spiritual activist, a minister, a leader, a wife, and a mother. And my mother heart, my mom heart, will not let me be anything other than honest and fierce about Oh, not just holding the perception of wholeness for our world, but in elevating it as well. This journey for LGBTQ is a sacred one. And I believe that the trans journey specifically is one of profound, deep spiritual alchemy connect connected to ancient and wondrous beings. So I offered the quote earlier, the truth will set you free. And what I know is that we as spiritual beings live in a spiritual world of spiritual laws, and we must now step forward even more powerfully and authentically and lovingly and heroically into the truth that we are perfect, whole, complete beings as we are right here and right now. So whatever your spiritual practice is, raise the bar on it. Raise the bar on it and begin to really, really affirm and know the truth that you and I are part of God that we are one with God, that our oneness is our most sacred, most profound gift, and it cannot be denied. It will not be denied. So let's live according to that. Let's celebrate that. You know, we are celebrations of the one, and we are weaving a tapestry of this thing called life, and we must uphold it. We must champion it. We must celebrate it. And we must also know that holding this consciousness of ally, we can change the world. We can shift this. You know, I hear a lot about leveraging one's privilege, and I invite everybody to leverage any privilege you think you have to be allies for all who seek acceptance, for all, regardless of their gender, where they are in the gender spectrum, or racial spectrum, or cultural spectrum, when you see someone who needs love, please love them. Please step forward. Be forward, be, be there for them, be present. Be conscious, be compassionate. You know, there's a song that a friend of mine named David Friedman wrote, and it's called We Can Be Kind. And, he, and this is really what I was thinking about today. 
as I looked around, and I know I'm going long, but I really appreciate your, your patience with me. So there's a line, he says, um, what can you do when there's nothing you can do? We can be kind, we can take care of each other. We can remember that deep down inside we all need the same thing. And maybe we'll find if we are there for each other that together we'll weather whatever tomorrow might bring. I remember singing that song, the service that we held here after 9-11. The, the guidance is still the same. We still can be kind and loving and compassionate with each other. So I want to close with a quote that I found while worshiping at the altar of RuPaul. We are all born naked and the rest is drag. Naked or in drag, we are all sacred and holy beings. We are God in our own various versions and expressions of drag. Thank God for my shoes. So let's be God. Let's just be that now, whether in drag or not in drag. Right now, any, be any time between now and right now, as Dr. Mark would say, would be a good time to start with this. Go be God. Be an ally. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, let's pray, shall we? We surrender to the greater. We surrender to the greater, which is love. We surrender to the greater, which is one, which is the presence of peace, which is the truth of all life, that there is one life. That life is God. That life is perfect. That life is whole. That life is our life. Right here, right now, there is one mind. It is that mind which informs us, guides us, guards us, protects us. It is the truth of who and what we are. And right here in this place, we agree to simply erase any vestige of saying yes, any, uh, uh, any vestige of limitation or, or hesitation to saying yes to that truth. We let go of any no, of any denial or of any fear, and we know that yes, I am part of the great mind of God, the great life of God. There is one life. That life is God. That life is perfect. That is my life now, and I know this for all of us, and that we are yes, saying yes, 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 and that we are able willing and sacredly blessed to move out into the world holding the awareness that the light can never be dimmed, that the Christ light within us, the Allah light, the Buddha light, that namaste can never be dimmed for it is the truth of who and what we are. And we agree now to no longer deceive ourselves we agree now to tell the truth about that, and we step in strength. We own it. We become first allies for ourselves and then allies for each other. We see something and we bless. We see someone and we, we love. And I invite each of us to just simply look out upon the world and to recognize and to say, I see you, I bless you, I love you. I see you, I bless you, I love you. Whether you can do something immediately or not, look out into the world. I see you, I bless you, I love you. I see you, I bless you, I love you. If you turn on your television tonight, I see you, I bless you, I love you. If you look at the headlines, I see you, I bless you, I love you. Because the more we do that, I know that each of us is shining brighter and brighter and brighter. The muscle grows, the light grows, our hearts grow, and we truly are those beings we have been waiting for. We do now as we would have others do unto us, which is love, which is love. So I know that as we do this, we also surround all of the beings everywhere in this country, wherever there is pain, we surround them with the knowing of compassion that they are not alone. And if that pain is within our own hearts, we are reminded that we are not alone. And we call to mind anyone in our world, in our lives, who we know needs love, needs reminding, to, needs remembering that they are divine beings. We let them know, I see you, I bless you, I love you. They are not alone. I know that the wholeness, the wholeness of God 
is the truth that sets us free. It sets Ukraine free. It sets Russia free. It sets all beings free. It will not be denied, and we will not deny it because we know it is the greater truth. And so I know that I accept these truths for myself and for all beings everywhere. Say that with me. I accept these truths for myself and all beings everywhere. And we let it be so. We let it be so. We let it be so because this is the nature of God. And all we are doing is finally surrendering ah, to that which is the truth. And yes, we are free. And so it is. And together we say, amen. Thank you, Mary. So Thank I'm you. going to invite you to take your offering, to hold it in your hand, and hold it to your heart. And say with me, from the love of pure spirit within, within me, me, I bless, bless this, this gift. I send, send it, it forth to heal and, and bless and, and prosper. It is, it is evidence of, of my faith and belief. It does, it does good, good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. abundantly. Bless it always, bless it always, by the arms of God surrounds us. Let our joy be so triumphant that we rest in God and say amen. Bless it always. Reverend pianist Steen, Sydney Steen, and Mary Hyland, tremendous.
talent, creativity right there. I'm the guy that delivers the announcements after the service. So thank you for being a part of your own spiritual journey and a part of mine, whether you've tuned in on the computer, iPad, or whatever, or here in the sanctuary. We are all blessed by being together tonight. So we make it easy for you to make donations to our church, the place that feeds you spiritually. The text to give number is inside your program, and there's a QR code on the back or go to nhcrs.org slash give. Prayer with a Practitioner is available after service in person on Zoom, and I know there's a few practitioners here, so avail yourself of that wonderful service. How can they do that, Sam? What's the best way if they're in the building? I think if you walk up front here, there'll be practitioners staying after the service once we finish, and all you have to do is ask, may I have prayer, or they'll recognize that you've moved forward and say, would you like prayer? And we do one-minute miracles. They might become two-minute miracles, but this would be a good time to ask for Some one. have been four or five minutes, but... Uh, it's, not tonight. It's, it's, not it's not called tonight, a one-minute miracle. Not tonight, it's called a one-minute miracle. <laughs> and I have been blessed by many one-minute miracles yeah, in my experience too. here at the church, both giving and receiving. It is a blessing to be sure. Next Wednesday evening service with Reverend Sidney Steen, probably not as pianist, but as our wonderful leader from the pulpit. I think I'll be speaking only. We'll yeah. see. Yeah. Is called Paint It Red. Okay? You can imagine that for a week and come back and hear what it's really like. <laughs> All right. And nice shoes and great talk, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This is important. Japan trip with Dr. Mark, October 22. Join Dr. Mark for the spiritual adventure of a lifetime. For details and sign up, visit our website. I am going. I know others that are going. I've been on a trip with Dr. Mark. If you haven't, it's a delight, it's fun, it's informative, it's spiritual, it's deep. It is well worth the money that you have to put out to take a plane to where you're going and all that. Uh, you come back a changed person, just like you do every time you come to church. Don't miss this. We have a new class. Our remarkable Dr. Mark is presenting a remarkable six-week class based on the teachings of a remarkable woman. How many times can you say the word Mark in a sentence and have it be grammatically correct? Emma Curtis Hopkins was and is one of the most profound New Thought icons. Her book, Scientific Christian Mental Practice, establishes an absolute and powerful foundation for healing and wholeness in ever, every area of our lives. Join Dr. Mark for this Scientific Christian Mental Practice, Part 1, Mondays beginning June 6, 6.30 to 8 on Zoom only, 6.30 p.m. The cost is $150. You can sign up on the patio on Sundays or go online and you can get the book in our bookstore or online. Is the bookstore open tonight? No. Okay, so Sunday. on Sundays or during the week if you happen to stop by and visit. NHCRS women's and men's groups meet together this Sunday, June 5th at 1230 p.m. The women's group and the men's group will having their yearly unified monthly meeting at 1230 in the youth church and on Zoom. All are welcome. So if you or a loved one could use some enhanced spiritual support, we have a pastoral care team ready to help. Please reach out to our team through our website or speak to me after the service. Zoom virtual patio before and after every Sunday and Wednesday services. Zoom meditation every morning, Monday through Saturday from 7.55 to 8.15 a.m. Visit our website, nhcrs.org, to obtain Zoom, Zoom links and more information about all our events and to sign up for weekly e-blasts and mon monthly newsletters. And now for our benediction, our favorite Reverend Sidney. Thank you. So I just invite all of us to agree that we're going to go forward in the world deeply aware of our holiness, of our sacredness, so that we can remember that everyone whom we encounter is filled with that same sacredness and that holiness. And therefore, we can remind each of them that all of us, all of us, we each are a light, but guess what? Together, when we shine, we shine brighter than the sun. Bless it always, bless it always. Thank you all for coming. Let's get some coffee. Thank you.